Um, I'm a graduate of uh, Lawrence Technical uh, Logical University and uh, with a bachelor's degree in uh, mechanical engineering. I have four U.S. patents and uh, I've written three books, um, nonfiction books. In November 1939, a headline event occurred. Packard offers fully air-conditioned car. On their 1940 Packard car, this is what the 1940 Packard car looked like. And this is what the air conditioning system looked like. Now just before I get into the details, this system was co-developed by Packard engineers and a company called Bishop Babcock in Ohio. And Bishop Babcock, uh, I think the, the company still exists, and, and they did most of the engineering work on developing this system. Comprised of a compressor, a condenser, an evaporator core, and a heater, refrigerant lines, and the cold air outlet from the evaporator assembly was through the package cell, behind the rear seat, and, the, and in front of the rear window was the cold air outlet for, for this air conditioning system. Today we expect air conditioning in this era. This was not a real popular option. Believe it or not, only about 2,000 of these systems were sold between 40, 41, and early 1942 when all production stopped. Now, one of the, there were two problems with this system. This cold air coming off, coming off the top of the rear seat was cold on the rear passenger's uh, necks, but uh, it didn't do a very effective job of cooling the driver and the, and the front seat passenger. So it, um, it was not a real popular option. Another interesting side note, and we'll talk about it in a moment. These early systems were not fitted with electromagnetic clutches. It was recommended that in the wintertime that the, uh, the belt be removed from the compressor for wintertime usage of the vehicle. This is a test trip uh, report uh, that uh, a newspaper wrote, uh, published in 1940 when they drove an air-conditioned Packard uh, in Pennsylvania, and they felt it worked very good. Uh, this was a very uh, going uh, uh, trip report. Uh, I think they drove it three days, and this this reporter drove it three days, and uh, and and he was pleased with the with the results. It was used for both heating and cooling. He said, and uh, he, he was pleased with the results. Again, this photo is interesting, and it shows the compressor, and uh, you can see there's no electromagnetic clutch. It's just the belt uh, riding on a pulley in the front of the compressor. This is the second car production vehicle to be fitted with air conditioning. 1941 Cadillac fitted with air conditioning. Uh, this, this car is owned by Mr. Dick Kuhn, who is a famous collector here in Detroit. Uh, the experts say there are only three 1941 Cadillacs still in existence that were fitted with factory air conditioning. So these are extremely rare cars. This one is a 100 point car uh, you can see the blue ribbon here. This, this, this gentleman that has this collection has nothing but the best cars. And this is an absolutely outstanding example of an of a air-conditioned car from that era. This is the Cadillac system. Again, uh, Bishop Babcock did this system. The compressor was mounted a little lower on the engine, the condenser. The evaporator assembly. Uh, this one did not have the heater located in, with the air conditioner in it. Uh, 1941 Cadillac offered automatic temperature control, but this is not uh, the type that we think of today when we think of automatic temperature control. This was automatic temperature control of the heating system in the 41 Cadillac. Now this was not the first automatic temperature control. That dash that I showed you a few moments ago offered uh, automatic temperature control the second year of production, I think in 1939. But this was, this was noteworthy in that uh, the, the 41 Cadillac uh, adopted this. This is another interesting uh, uh, aftermarket accessory from the 1940s. These were winds or uh, sunshades that uh, were fitted to the vehicle over the top of the windshield, and again, it was it was to minimize the uh, the sun load coming into the passenger compartment. 
Uh, somebody pointed out recently um, that these things uh, were very fuel inefficient in that there was a lot of uh, drag uh, on the vehicle moving through the air with, the, with these things. This was something that uh, was used in the southwest as an attempt to, to cool the vehicle. These were called evaporative coolers and uh, basically what they consisted of was ram air coming into this device. It was filled with water, uh, I say filled, uh, up to about halfway there was a water reservoir and a sisal, uh, a, a loosely knit uh, wood green or wooden fiber type uh, mat covered the top of it. it, acted as a sponge. The water would wick up through that sponge and then the, the uh, ram air would, would cross it, cause it to evaporate and drop the temperature of the, of the air by several degrees. And again, these things would only work in the southwest. Nevada, Arizona, uh, Southern California, they wouldn't work in this region because of the high humidity. For these things to work, you have to have low humidity. It was interesting to note that these things were still in production as of two years ago. Uh, a company was making reproductions of these devices for fitting to hot rods and restoration vehicles from this era uh, as a, something to, to make them look authentic from that era. This is the 1942 Pontiac heater system, noteworthy because it offered a heat exchanger under the, the front seat and a separate heat exchanger for the windshield defrosting. Um, this was not the first underseat heater. The 1940 Buick was one of the first with underseat heating, but uh, this system was considered noteworthy for, for that era uh, because of the, the uh, fan was out here at the front of the vehicle. The, the, Fresh air inlet was out in front, forced the air through this uh, tubing uh, and into the seat, under the seat heat, uh, heat exchanger. These under seat heaters were, were uh, considered to be superior to regular heaters because uh, the heat was, was coming from low and, it, and the breath level temperatures were lower. Uh, people tend to get drowsy when the breath level temperatures are high. And, it, and they tend to get drowsy. So this was considered a major improvement over, over the regular uh, dash-mounted heaters. This was the 1953 Cadillac. And remember, air conditioning went in production on the 1940 Packard. The 1941 Cadillac picked it up. 1942, World War II began. Nothing happened in the automobile business until 1947, uh, after the war. They began to resume production. At that point in time, the demand for vehicles was so high that they uh, weren't uh, working on the air conditioning systems. It took them two or three years to get caught up and uh, to re-engineer these systems. This 53 Cadillac, 1953, uh, basically the luxury makers, Cadillac, Lincoln, uh, Chrysler Imperials, three or four Chrysler models offered air conditioning in 1953. Again, the evaporator was located in the trunk. The air conditioner compressor had no, no um, electromagnetic clutch. So uh, not much happened between the 40 Packard and the 53 Cadillac, or the 53 air conditioning system. 1954, something significant happened. This is again a milestone. The 1954 Pontiac offered uh, the air conditioning system mounted on the, on the uh, cowl of the vehicle, on the, what we call the dash panel, uh, as opposed to the trunk. And this was a major milestone event. Now just an interesting sidebar on this 1954 Pontiac system. I just read an article within the last few days that said a team of uh, engineers at Delphi uh, found one of these Pontiacs, and there are supposedly only about 10 existing in the entire world of, of 1954 Pontiacs with factory air conditioning. This team of Delphi engineers volunteered to restore a Pontiac, and, uh, and it's a very, very uh, wonderful restoration featuring a uh, factory air conditioning system. The 1954 Nash also offered the air conditioning fitted to the, uh, to the dash panel of the vehicle, and uh, 
this system was considered a very, very uh, uh, outstanding air conditioning system from that era. The road, this road test uh, said that it was an absolutely outstanding air conditioning. This is something that uh, very few people, very few people uh, probably know about. These were called desert water bags. And again, for the Southwest, when traveling through the desert in that early era, these things were essentially mandatory. They were, you, the uh, driver of the vehicle filled these things with water, hung them on the outside of the vehicle, either on the bumper like this. It was common to hung them around uh, the radio antenna or the hood or ornament of the car. But uh, the way they worked is you wanted air to be crossing this canvas bag, and it was constructed such that the water would sort of wick to the surface and again evaporate, and then there would be a cooling effect. These bags were important for two reasons. Number one, the vehicle broke in the middle of the desert, which was common in that era. Engine failure, tires failed because of the very high temperatures in the desert. The, the people in the vehicle could drink this for water. Uh, and uh, if and it, it was common for people to have very serious uh, consequences if their vehicle failed while crossing the desert. The other uh, use for this water, of course, was for the for the radiator of the vehicle. Uh, overheating was very common, and um, so this these desert water bags were were very popular. I mentioned climate automatic climate control uh, or automatic temperature control previously, um, the 39 and the 40. Uh, era cars. Well, 64 Cadillac was the first automatic temperature control system as we know it today. The control featured an off position, automatic, defrost, and a thumb wheel to select the temperature. So this was the, the first uh, automatic temperature control system as we know it today. Uh, the same vehicle offered uh, a um, manual control. Uh, this was in their, their big uh, luxury sedan that they, they offered the manual control. In this era, uh, factory air conditioning systems were really relatively expensive, so the aftermarket jumped in and were offering uh, hang-on air conditioning systems, and there were numerous aftermarket companies in business in the, the 60s and 70s offering uh, uh, hang-on air conditioning systems, and a lot of them uh, advertised that you could uh, actually take the air conditioning system with you when you change vehicles. You could, you could uh, move the AC system with you. 1966 Buick Riviera featured flow-through ventilation. Even this era when, when air conditioning was readily available, ventilation was still considered a, uh, a popular item and an important item for a lot of vehicle owners. And uh, the other reason that I wanted to point and show you this slide is this was the end of the era for what we call the ventipanes. I showed you the ventipanes earlier. This was one of the first vehicles to get rid of the ventipanes. With the, with the air conditioning systems, you didn't, need, you didn't need them. Although the smokers liked them. <laughs> this is an interesting uh, patent. Uh, this, this patent was awarded to this Robert Kearns. He was a professor here at Wayne State University here in Detroit. Uh, this, this patent was for electronic control of wind, electrical windshield wiper systems. Uh, there have been previous patents for mechanical control systems for windshield wiper systems, but Mr. Kearns was the first with an electronic control for windshield wiper systems. This led to multi-million dollar lawsuits that he won and generated uh, a movie called uh, Flash of Genius, which is an interesting story, and if you haven't seen the film, I, I recommend it. It, uh, it. it tells the complete story on, on how this thing evolved and how he won the lawsuits. Uh, 1972, Saab offered a heated seat. Uh, again, these were common today, but uh, 72 is one of the first years for that. Uh, this, for, for the young people, uh, is how Automobiles uh, were designed up until the computer-aided design era. This is a drafting board. This is called a sweep. That's called the compass. Those are triangles. Uh, these things are called nerd packs. Computers were just starting in this era, but uh, this, this is how it was done up until uh, computers 
took over. And this, by the way, was how uh, the, it was, people were dressed in the automotive industry in Detroit uh, up until, uh, I, I would say, uh, what, the 1990s. Uh, we got more casual, but uh, coats and ties and uh, white shirts were very, were essentially mandatory. This was uh, a forecast that I made from 1992, as I said, when I, I wrote the, uh, the book for Ford Motor Company. I made several predictions, and I didn't dream these up. Uh, there have been articles in the trade journals that uh, forecast uh, various things. Uh, integrated air conditioning and, and uh, radio controls, uh, push-button electrical electronic systems, voice recognition, voice control, individual zone control, fuzzy logic and electroluminescent lighting, instant comfort, uh, total quiet operation, uh, integrated sensors, uh, and uh, again, I didn't dream these up, but uh, th there were inkling of, inklings of it on the horizon at that point in time. Essentially, everything is in production today. Uh, 97 Saab offered ventilated seats. Uh, in 1999, the Lincoln Navigator was one of the first vehicles to offer heated and cool seats by a company called Amerigon. They're located here in uh, Farmington. Michigan, and uh, these seats use PTC technology to uh, actually heat and cool the seats. Positive temperature coefficient. Is that it? Uh, PTCs are, is the acronym, and uh, this is this is one of the first uh, applications, and and of course these are very popular today. This is the state of the art. We're we're now into modern times. Um, 2013 Lexus LS um, features enhanced interior heating for faster heater output, cold weather, nearly instantaneous heating in the winter, headlamp washers, um, power rear door shades, rear seat cool box, rear seat air purifier, four zone climate control including rear overhead ducts and infrared um, rear passenger temperature sensors, uh, power rear sunshades, heated wood steering wheel, rear window defogger, and rain sensing intermittent windshield wipers. Again, a lot of that stuff was on that list that I showed you a moment ago. So all kinds of stuff comes over the internet, and uh, this showed up one day, and uh, I thought this was a real interesting <laughs> heater control. Uh, <laughs> it's some sort of bathroom faucet uh, that uh, they hooked up, and I don't know if this is a gag photo or real photo, but anyway, uh, I thought this was cute. And finally, this <laughs> is the quintessential heating or air conditioning uh, service fix. The, uh, this car features a 110 volt generator mounted to the trunk and a 110 volt uh, room air conditioner <laughs> mounted to the side window of the car. And uh, it uh, is one alternative to uh, repairing the uh, factory fitted air conditioning system. And that uh, completes the overview of the book. Uh, I appreciate your attention for watching and uh, hope you enjoy the video. Thank you.